And good morning, saints from South Carolina. Okay, here's what we're going to do today. If you see here, I put up a little chart. I've done this with every book of the Bible. What I suggest you do is take a manila folder and inside of it make a, a, a column for each chapter. And then write in your insights. That's what I do. That's, it kind of gives me a overview of what I'm going through. Okay, and here in the book of 1 Thessalonians, then I can see at a glance the progression of what's happening. Okay, and I told you last time that if you really want to understand 1 Thessalonians, you got to go back to the book of Acts. Because in the book of Acts, you have the backdrop for the setting for the Apostle Paul writing 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. There was a lot of unique things about this church. Okay, before I get in the message, though, let me just say a couple of other things. Man, this is so amazing. Here's what's amazing about this church is that the Apostle Paul was only there for three weeks to at the most three months. And he planted this church and this church just took off. It had a reputation that went all through Macedonia. Now, here's what's interesting. When I was in Bible school and seminary, around, uh, well, around, it started around the late 70s, early 80s, you had a movement called the Church Growth Movement. In fact, they would even train pastors how to grow a church. Mostly it wasn't church planning like the Apostle Paul does. It was more like proselytizing. And so what they introduced was a lot of business management skills. Now, there's nothing wrong with being organized, but they became the forefront of church planning. Not only that, but entertainment. So the idea was to create a lot of professionalism in the church. Well, what happened is it moved away from the very essential things that are necessary to really develop and grow a church. And this is what the Apostle Paul did, and this is what we're going to see, okay? We're going to go back to Acts 17, and I'm going to read to you. The book of Thessalonians, as you can see up here, at a glance, chapters 1 through 3, the Apostle Paul is looking back. He's reminiscing what has happened, what led up to them, what they're doing, and so forth. Chapters 4 and 5 is projecting. He's looking forward. He's telling them, hey, this is what you need to do now. They were also greatly concerned about the second coming of Christ and the rapture. So he's trying to settle them because some of them were quitting their jobs. They were, Jesus is coming any moment. What's the point of working? Okay. Others were really doing very well. And their reputation went out all through Macedonia. Mind you, the Apostle Paul wasn't there very long, okay? Timothy went back to Thessalonica, and he went and reported to Paul what was going on. That prompted Paul to write this letter. Okay, let me go back to Acts, because I think, and I'm going to refer to a few things here that he did, and what we're going to look at as cause and effect. So if you want to grow a church, you want to plant a church? You want to be used of God? You want to make a difference in your community? Look, I've been, I'm have been i here in Myrtle Beach. I hunted all through the churches here. I haven't been able to find one Bible church here. Okay, there's a lot of denominational churches. There's a lot of mega churches. There are a lot of what they call musical worship service type church churches. They don't understand what worship is at all. It's not a it's not an entertaining session. It's a 24-7, what Jesus told the woman at the well. There's coming a day when people are going to worship me in spirit 
and in truth. That's how you worship. That's 24-7. Okay? But because of this church growth movement, people that are under 40, for the most part here in America, I don't know about the rest of the world, they have experienced this church growth movement. So that's what they come up under. Okay? I, a lot of it is counterfeit. It's not the real thing. Okay, now that sounds kind of critical. I know that. Uh, do they do good things in the church? Sure, they do, but it's watered down for the most part. Jesus makes mention of that in Revelation chapter three. I wish you were like hot or cold, but because you're like lukewarm water, I spit you out of my mouth. Okay, they exchange the reality and the presence of God for professionalism. Okay. The problem with that is, there's a church here that they had a coup, a coup, is that the pastor went against the elders. The elders had him to resign. The people in the church, they revolted. All the elders ended up resigning. They put the pastor back up as a dictator. No church should center on one person. The church is a body. Okay, the problem with doing church professionalism is this. If the person, the prominent person that's up there doing all the thing, when he leaves or dies, everything falls apart. It's greatly dependent on him. I have seen that happen over and over, both with little, medium, and big churches. A good church is where a pastor comes. He trains his people so that they become independent of him. Okay, just like a father does a child. You don't want to keep your child under your tutelage all your life. You want to train them and let them go. Paul says, find faithful people that can train other faithful people, and you have that multiplication process. This is what Paul does. So let me go back to Acts 17. You want to get a chart, pencil, and paper. It's a good time to do this. Follow along as I teach you this. Okay, Acts chapter 17. When they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica where there was a Jewish synagogue. Now, this is very interesting because this gives Paul, who was a Pharisee of Pharisees, an opportunity and a legal way, legitimate way, of getting in and introducing the message he's going to bring both to Jews and Gentiles. Okay, Paul went into the synagogue, and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from Scripture. So that's when we get to three, that could either be three weeks, or some people say, yeah, that was three months, three sessions. We don't really know, okay, about how long he was in Thessalonica. And listen to this. He was, Paul went into the synagogue, and on three Sabbath days, he did three things. First of all, he reasoned with them. You go and do evangelism, you need to know apologetics. You need to understand prolegomena. You need to know how to reasonably explain, which is what he also did. He reasoned with them from the scriptures. Okay, he knew the word of God. Explaining, that means giving more information so that they could grasp what he was saying and then proving that Christ had to suffer and rise from the dead, which is the essence of the gospel, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Okay. This Jesus I'm proclaiming to you is the Christ, he said. And some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks or Gentiles, and not a few prominent women. Okay, but a lot of Jews were jealous, okay? They were jealous that, that Paul comes along and does that. But I want you to notice those three words. He reasoned, he explained, and he proved. Okay, now let's go to, let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. And let's look at it a little differently. Paul's writing, Paul, Silas, and Timothy. So he gives reference to Silas and Timothy, who also had gone there with him. Grace and peace to you. We always thank God for you, mentioning you in our prayers. So the first thing he did 
was he gave thanks. He's reminiscing. He's looking back now. Okay, as I said, in chapters 1, 2, and 3, Paul is reminiscing what had happened. We always thank God for all of you mentioning you in our prayers. We continually remember before our God and Father your work. That's the second thing, is that they remembered. What was it that they remembered? Let's look. That before our God, your work, if you want to know what true Christians do, your work produced by faith. Your labor prompted by love. Your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, his return. Okay, those are the three essential ingredients when people are doing ministry and how you can evaluate it. You know, the, the Bible gives us a lot of insight in terms of discernment. What is a person's true motivation? Okay, and here you see it, it is three different things. It's faith, it's love, and it's hope. Okay, that is what produces real dynamic ministry and what produces an exemplary testimony. Then in verse 4, brothers loved by God, we know that he has chosen you. Now he's going to review Okay, we know that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with three things, with power, with the Holy Spirit, and with deep conviction. There's another. So we're getting all kind of insight as to how the dynamics of a true ministry takes place. He says it comes with power, the Holy Spirit, and deep conviction. Now, if you have a little fun, go and do a word study on each one of those. I see in Acts 1.8, people take the word power, and the Holy Spirit came with power, and they take it complete like it's dynamite or something like that. It has nothing to do with that. Power has to do with ability to do something I wasn't able to do before. Okay? And that is give testimony and witness I have the ability. Why? Because I got a new nature. I didn't have a own, I had an old nature before. I couldn't explain. I couldn't even understand. But now I got a new nature. I had that power in me. Okay. I have been seated in the heavenlies. Okay. We're getting a whole lot of that. But also in the power of the Holy Spirit. Apart from Christ, we can do what? Nothing. But through the Holy Spirit, we are empowered to be a communicable witness that people can embrace. And you know what they say? This is real. I can tell the difference when somebody's giving a cliche or talking and when somebody is speaking through the power and ministry of the Holy Spirit. And so can the lost. Okay? And those that are receptive, man, they just, they just eat this up. Okay? They're just like little kids with sponges and they just draw all this in with the Holy Spirit. But notice what else. It, he says, it's also wit. We came to you with deep, conviction. Not just any kind of conviction, mediocre conviction, deep conviction. This is, man, this is what moves me. This is what, it, what drives me. I gotta do this. And the Apostle Paul said, it, 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 it is my love for Christ that compels me. It compels me. It moves me. I gotta share the gospel with you, but I don't want to do it in an untactful, stupid, crazy, idiotic way. I want to do it in such a way that it's going to be receptive to you so that you can become born again. Isn't that amazing? This is an amazing, amazing book. Okay, let's keep going. Okay. And, and, and it wasn't with just, just with that, with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, and with deep community. You know. He's telling them, hey, I'm going to give testimony about something you know. You know how we lived among you for your sake. When I went, I'm constantly concerned about this. I never want to be a stumbling block. I want to be a minister. I'm not going to ride in the limousine or, or Jaguar. I'm not going to ride in the BMW. Are those things wrong? No, but I don't want to cause anybody to stumble. 
I'm not going to fly around in my own private jet. I'm not going to buy a mansion if I have uh, uh, money. You know, I'm going to invest it in things. Why? Because I don't want to be a, a, a stumbling block. He says, you know how we have lived among you for your sake. For your sake. Why do I do the things? For your sake. For your sake. And you know the people that know me have gone with me. When, when I go to get, and when the first thing I say, I don't want to cost anybody to stumble. Let's find something. You want a car? Yeah. I need something to go from A to B. Oh, no. Or, or, or do you want an adventure? <laughs> well, if that's the case, give me a Rolls Royce. I'll have an adventure. I'm not looking for an adventure. Not that kind. You know, I just want to go from A to B without causing anybody to stumble. Okay, same thing in clothes, appearance, and everything else. I know that all those things are changeable, they're tangible, but we got to be mindful. That's why the Bible says, and, and the Apostle Paul says, if eating meat causes my brother to stumble, may I never eat meat again. Now, you want to have a testimony, you want to make a difference, watch how you live. And that's what the Apostle Paul says here. He says, you know how we lived among you for your sake. And look at the cause. Now, you have cause and result cause and effect. Okay, what they did, how they did it, what was the effect? You became imitators of us. You became imitators of us and of the Lord. In spite of severe suffering, you welcomed the message with joy given by the Holy Spirit. And so you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. The Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, your faith in God has become known everywhere. Mind you, that's in three weeks or three months. You think that's, e that's an effective way of planning the church? When you do it in the power and the Holy Spirit with deep convictions and you live a lifestyle that is genuine and they recognize it, and the people see that and they begin to imitate you, it's going to go out all over. That's how you build a reputation. You don't have to spend exorbitant amount of money on advertisement. You don't have to have padded seats in your church. You don't even need a building. Okay, there's no mention of a building here. Okay, he says, therefore, we do not need to say anything about it, for they themselves re report what kind of reception you gave us. They tell, and this is the bottom line, how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven and to wait for his son from whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us, and listen to this phrase he's going to say, from the coming wrath. He's speaking of the tribulation. He didn't say who rescues us through, but from and the coming wrath, according to the scripture, is the tribulation. Okay? So now he's going to get a little bit more into that, chapters 2 and 3. And as we go on through 4 and 5, what's the message in this? You want to make a difference for the Lord Jesus Christ? you got to do it his way. Not the world's way. Okay? You need to reason with people. In order to do that, you've got to know the Word of God. You need to explain it to people. In order to do that, you need to know apologetics. Okay, how to give a defense to your faith. You need to know prolegomena, how to understand your worldview as opposed to others. Okay, you need to be able to prove, Oh, Manny, I don't know all that. I've got to go to school and all that. Yeah. The Bible says, Study to show yourself approved as a wordman who need not be ashamed accurately handling the word of truth. That means you and me and every born-again believer. Now, do some have a gift of teaching and, and can do it maybe a little better? Yeah, of course. But you also have the Holy Spirit in you, and he can make your reason, your explanation, and proving believable through the power and ministry of the Holy Spirit. Okay? you got to watch your lifestyle. And then... You need to recognize you're doing it through the power, through the Holy Spirit, and you've got to make it your deep conviction. Brothers and sisters, if you would just follow the biblical model of church growth and development, 
you're going to make a difference where you are. Isn't that what it's all about? Jesus is coming back soon. You know, he's going to deliver us from the wrath. That's what Thessalonians were waiting on. God bless you all. We'll see you later. Bye-bye.